Good morning, Christ Baptist. Good morning. This is October, and this month we are celebrating breast cancer and domestic violence awareness. We're asking that you wear your ribbons proudly each day of the month. Bring your ribbon back next Sunday. These, we encourage everyone to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Booster shots are available in Lake and Porter County. Please follow our safety guidelines. Remain masked. Please refrain from embracing and or handshaking. Please maintain social distancing. We want to keep everyone safe. And also, it's October. It's time for those flu shots. Sunday school continues to be held on Sunday mornings by telephone conference calls. There are three classes each Sunday, 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. New members meet on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Teenagers and young adults, 11 a.m. On Saturday, Facebook Live. Please call the church for the phone numbers to join. Social media, you don't have to belong to Christ Baptist to join us for Sunday school. You are invited. Please contact the church at 219-938-5504 for further information. Likewise, social media and Christ Baptist family. Wednesday is Bible study. If you are interested in joining us, again, call the office at 219-938-5504 and provide your email to be notified of the telephone number to join and to receive the guide, study guide. Our pastor will certainly welcome you. Amen. Also this morning, a young man came to the door and when he said jobs, 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 I said announce, announce, announce. If you know anyone that's looking for jobs, this Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to noon is at Atlas Employment Services. And that's at 9401 Georgia Street in Crown Point, Indiana. It's quality pasta. And they're looking for, they have competitive salaries, first and second shifts, and also weekends are available. They're asking that you bring two forms of ID. And the phone number is 708-435-9054. There are flyer little pieces of paper out there for anybody that's looking for a job that may be interested, please pick one up and give it to them. These were your morning announcements. This is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Early detection is the key. Know the warning signs. Touch, look, and check for changes. Men, this includes you as well. More men are being diagnosed with breast cancer than ever before. Have a wonderful, safe, and blessed week. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Oh, we ought to give God a hand praise for our choir. Amen. They have brought us to the place where we're ready to hear the word of God. I'm asking that you turn in your Bibles to two passages of scripture. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. And the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Reverend Jonathan Moore is here now to read the scriptures. He's going to repeat the scriptures also, but Luke, chapter 5, and John's Gospel, chapter 21. Reverend Jonathan. Amen. We begin with Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and then we will move on to John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, the NIV version. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and talked the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full, they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Now we're moving over to John chapter 21. And I'll begin at verse 1 and go down to verse 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped, out, jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, but a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, 
bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. That is the word of God for the people of God, blessed in the presence of the almighty God. Amen. Amen.
Yes, yes. One of these old days, I'm going to put on my robe and tell the story. I'm going to tell the Lord all about it. All that we've been through, all that we've had to overcome, I'm going to put on my robe and tell the story. When I get home, we ought to give the choir, give God a hand praise for the choir. I thank God for Reverend Jonathan Moore reading the scripture this morning so clearly and boldly for your understanding. I know it's a long passage of scripture, Luke chapter 5 and, and the gospel of John chapter 21. I want us to keep our Bibles open to John 21. And then mark in your notes in Luke chapter five, underline verse 11. When the disciples, when Jesus told the disciples, from now on, you will fish for people. And the disciples, they pulled their boats up on shore and they left everything and followed him. But in John chapter 21, they go back to fishing. What happened? What took place between Luke chapter five and John 21? What made them unanchor their boats and go back in the water? You know, life will throw some things your way that will make you want to go back to what you used to do before you met Christ. Life will throw so many obstacles in your way. They will throw some things. Here we are, we've endured a pandemic. So many churches have had to close their doors. So many home going, so many folks in and out of the hospital sick. So much discouraging news, so many so many hospital visits and funerals, it will discourage you to where you just want to get away. Southwest Airlines has that slogan, do you want to get away? Just get away, even from ministry. You get to the point where you say to yourself, I don't want to hear any James Cleveland right now. I don't want to hear any, any Shirley Caesar right now. I just want to be left <coughs> alone. That's where the disciples are in John's gospel chapter 21. They have been met with so many disappointments. They have been discouraged and now they're going back to where they used to be before they met Jesus. This morning I want to teach and preach from the subject title Revived, Refreshed, and Restored. Revived, refreshed, and restored. Won't you bow in a moment of prayer? Oh, gracious and merciful Father in heaven, thank you. You do such wonderful things, God, and I'm grateful. Now, Lord, I pray that you use me as you will. Let your word go forth with boldness and clarity, where your name is magnified and glorified. Your people are edified and your kingdom is advanced. This is my prayer. I'm your servant and you're my God. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Revived, refreshed, and restored. In Luke chapter 5 and in the Gospel of John chapter 21, these are the recordings of two fishing trips. The parallels are so striking that one may think it's the same fishing event. The similarities in these two fishing trips may cause one to think that John is writing about the same fishing trip that Luke is writing about. Look at the parallels in Luke chapter five, verse five, the disciples had fished all night without catching anything. 
In John's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 3, the Bible says the disciples fished all night without catching anything. The parallels are striking. In Luke 5 and 1, Jesus is standing on the seashore. In John's Gospel, 21 and 4, Jesus is standing on the seashore. The parallels are striking, but these are two separate fishing trips. Not only that, the fishing trip that occurs in John's Gospel, chapter 21, this fishing trip takes place three and a half years after the fishing trip in Luke's Gospel. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, this is where the disciples meet Jesus. In Luke 5 and 10, this is where Jesus calls the disciples. This is where Jesus commissions them to go out and become fishers of men. In Luke 5, Jesus says to them, from now on, you will fish for people. And verse 11 reads, they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. But something happened between Luke 5 and John 21. For three and a half years, the disciples have been teaching and preaching about Jesus. For three and a half years, the disciples had been performing ministry. They had been going about healing the sick. They went about delivering people, setting the captives free. For three and a half years, the disciples witnessed the miracles of Jesus. All this time, the disciples proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. What happened? Now in John 21, they go back to fishing. What happened? What made them go back to what they used to do? Sometimes the events of life will make you want to go back to where you were before you met Jesus. Somebody met Jesus in the nightclub. Somebody met Jesus on the street in the alley. And life will throw some things your way to where you go back to the nightclub. You want to go back to the streets. But what happened to the disciples? What events caused the disciples to go back to their old ways? Well, that's why John's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 1, begins with the phrase afterward. The King James Bible says, after these things. After what things? After the crucifixion of Jesus. After Judas had betrayed him. After the disciples had abandoned him. After Peter had denied him three times. After these things after the resurrection of Christ. Don't you know there are some things that will occur in your life that after you endure them, it'll make you want to go back. It'll make you want to go backwards after these things, after you lose your job, after you lose your home, after you have to say farewell to a loved one. After a tragedy, after a disappointment, a heartache, after these things, after the troubles of life come your way, sometimes it'll make you want to give up. That's where the disciples are in our scripture today. After Jesus was crucified, Peter and the disciples had literally given up on their ministry. They had been called out by Jesus to perform ministry, and now they want to give up. They had followed Jesus for three and a half years. They had seen the miracles, signs, and wonders that Jesus performed. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Even Peter said way out in Caesarea Philippi when Jesus asked the disciples, Who do men say that I am? It was Peter who said, Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The disciples sat at his feet when he taught them. The disciples broke bread with the master. They followed him. So why would they give up on someone they believed in? I submit to you this morning that the disciples were scared. You ever been scared? 
You ever been afraid? I know it's October and where all the spooky things come out in October. And I, I know sometimes, you know, the sun sets a little earlier these days. We want to be in before it gets dark outside. We, we want to be in and secure before it's night because strange things come out at night. Somebody said that the freaks come out at night. You ever been afraid? <clears throat> the disciples were afraid. They were scared. They were in fear. And when you're in fear, when you're afraid, you forget about all the good things the Lord has done for you. When you are in fear, you, you forget about the blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon you. When you're in fear, you worry about your own skin. You worry about your own life. When you're in fear, you don't even worry about other folks. Because fear, fear will make your teeth chatter. Fear will make your knees knock together. Fear will make you stand still when you ought to be running. Fear will make you be quiet when you should be shouting. They were in fear. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And since God does not give the spirit of fear, then we know where fear comes from. Why were the disciples so afraid? Why were the disciples in fear? Because they had witnessed their leader suffer a horrible death. They question each other, how could someone who healed others die in such a manner? How could someone who delivered other people, how could someone who, who saved and opened blinded eyes and unstopped deaf ears, how could Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead, how could he die in such a horrific way? How could Jesus who had so much power allow some low-ranking Roman soldiers to put him to death by nailing him to an old rugged cross. They were in fear, church. How can someone with so much power die in such a manner? What do you do when you're in fear? What do you do when you are afraid? Remember, after the death of Jesus, the disciples went into hiding. The disciples didn't want anyone to know that they followed Jesus. In John's Gospel, chapter 18, Peter denied knowing Jesus over and over and over again. They were afraid. They were scared. They were traumatized. And what do they do in the midst of this fear that has taken them over? What do they do? They go back to their old lives. Don't go back to your old life. Don't go back to your old ways. Look at it. They go back to their old lives in John 21 and verse 3. I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going to do what I like to do. I'm going to do what I'm used to do. Peter, who Jesus called to build the church. Peter is abandoning his calling to ministry. Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now Peter has quit. Peter has given up and thrown in the towel. Not only Peter but the other disciples as well. Verse 3 again. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat. But that night they caught nothing. Peter was their leader. They looked up to Peter. And when the leader walked away from the mission, the others followed. Look who's with them. Thomas called Didymus, that means twin. His twin brother was with him. He it was twin brother and Andrew and Nathaniel, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. These are the Lord's called out preachers. 
Remember, Peter, he preached uh, on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls came to Christ. And now he's going fishing. James and John, they would preach so hard that Jesus referred to them as the sons of thunder. And now the preachers are out, out on the water fishing. Church, this is an important point in verse 3. This is an important point because this is a this is nearly a victory for the devil because these disciples are Jesus's chosen apostles. And this is nearly a victory for the devil because in Luke chapter six, verse 13, the record is Jesus went up on the mountainside and chose 12 apostles. These are the men that Jesus chose to go ye into all the world and make disciples. These are the ones that are to go ye into all the world and spread the good news of the gospel. But now they've gone backwards. Now they've gone back to their old lives, their old ways. This could be a victory for the old devil. You see, the devil could not stop Jesus from being born in Bethlehem. The devil could not stop Jesus from growing up and going about doing good. The devil could not stop Jesus from healing the sick and raising the dead. The devil could not stop Jesus from going to Calvary, from, from shedding his blood on an old rugged cross for the remission of sin. The devil could not stop Jesus from rising from the grave. The devil could not stop Jesus from carrying out his earthly mission. But since the devil could not stop Jesus, the devil is going to try to stop you. He's going to try to stop you from serving the Lord. And the devil knows that if the Lord's preachers quit, then that old devil gets the victory. That old devil knows that if the Lord's servants don't carry out their work, if you don't preach about all that Jesus did, then that old devil wins. If nobody knows about the goodness of the Lord, if you don't tell somebody about Jesus, stop telling folks about what you saw on CNN and Fox News. Why don't you tell somebody about Jesus? If you don't tell somebody about Jesus, then that old dirty low down dog devil gets the victory. These are the Lord's chosen servants. And rather than going about telling somebody about Jesus, they're out somewhere in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They're out somewhere on a boat in the middle of the night catching nothing. They're way out there on the water. <laughs> they're way out there doing nothing but wasting their time. If you don't tell somebody about Jesus, then the devil wins. They're out there on the water sitting around looking at each other, twiddling their thumbs because they're not getting a single bite. You ever been fishing and you never got a bite? You feel like you're wasting your time. What a waste of time. You see, the devil, the devil, he gets the victory when you don't act on your faith. Where you don't act on your calling. When the Lord has told you to do something and you go somewhere and sit down and not do it, then the devil wins, church. When you don't carry out your portion of God's will. See, the devil doesn't care if you call yourself a Christian as long as you don't worship. The devil doesn't care that you have a Bible as long as you don't read it. The devil doesn't care about you bragging about what church you go to. Oh, I go to Christ Baptist Church, but you never show up. Uh, the fact of the matter is the devil doesn't even care if you come to church as long as you go to sleep when you get there. The devil doesn't care about you coming to church as long as when you're in church, you're playing on your phone while the word is going forward. The devil doesn't care about any of that because he gets the victory when you go away from what Jesus has commanded you to do. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there are some fishermen in the house. <clears throat> and there's nothing wrong with going fishing if that's your hobby. It's all right to play golf if that's your, your recreation. It's all right to go bowling. 
It's all right to go to the movies if, if that's your recreation and, and the things you like to do on your off time. But the fishing, but fishing, going fishing for the disciples was not recreation. This was their vocation and occupation. And Jesus had given them a new occupation. If golf is my recreation and preaching is my called out vocation, if I'm on the golf course on Sunday morning doing worship time, then I've gone away from what God has called me to do. And there are some beautiful Sunday mornings when the sun is coming up. It's good. It could be good to be on the golf course, but I would be wrong. It'd be something wrong with that picture for God's called out servant to go away from what God has called him or her to do. Amen. If the deacons and spiritual leaders are, are fishing when the doors of the church are open, when the servants of God are at the bowling alley during the hour of power, during the hour of worship and prayer, there's something wrong with that picture. There was something special about Sunday morning. When I grew up, you got up and you had breakfast and your clothes were all laid out for you. When you're getting ready for Sunday school, the television was on the Jubilee Showcase. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. The Jubilee Showcase. Watching Inez Andrews and, or Shirley Caesar. And when the Jubilee Showcase went off, it's time to go to Sunday school. Yeah. You ought to be in worship. You ought to be in prayer. You ought to be in Sunday school on Sunday morning. Yeah. Something wrong with that picture when God's servants go away from what God has called them to do. I know we get a little tired sometimes. I know we get a little burned out sometimes. We get a little weary sometimes and we need to get away sometimes. We need a little R&R. &R. That's when we need to take a vacation. And I, I wanna submit to you this morning that you're gonna get weary in the work of the Lord. But remember the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, therefore my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. And then the Bible counsels us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You're going to get tired. You're going to get weary of all the stresses of life. You're going to get weary of all the setbacks and disappointments of life. But thanks be to God that Jesus knows all about us. Thanks be to God that Jesus, when you're going through, when you're weary, Jesus sees us. Jesus sees you. The scripture says when the disciples were, went out fishing all night in verse 3 and caught nothing, the Bible says that Jesus was looking right at them. It's right there in verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus sees them, and Jesus sees you. And the disciples, Jesus is watching them, and they don't even know it. And then in verse 5, he called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. You see, when you go away from God's will, you on the wrong side of the boat. Throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Church, that's revival. They, they know how to fish. But Jesus had to teach them how to fish. That's revival. The disciples have been revived. Verse 7, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for Peter had taken his clothes off and Peter jumped in the water. If anybody needed reviving, it was Peter. Yeah.
Peter got so excited that he didn't sail the boat over to Jesus. The Bible says it was about a hundred yards. Church, that's a football field. And Peter got so excited that he did a double somersault like Forrest Gump and jumped in the water and swam to Jesus. That's revival, church. The other disciples followed in the boat. And when they got to the seashore, verse 9 tells us that Jesus had made a fire and was cooking some bread and some fish. Jesus was making what fishermen call a shore lunch. In verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. That's refreshing. Oh, to have breakfast with the Lord. Oh, to sit down at the morning table with Jesus. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. He did the same thing with the fish. The scripture says this was the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. There's something about that number three. There's something about the third time. Because every now and then, you need the Lord to rejuvenate you. Every now and then, you need the Lord to revive you. And every now and then, you need the Lord to refresh you. All the disciples needed reviving. All the disciples needed refreshing. And they also needed restoration. But no one more than Peter needed to be restored back to his rightful place. From verses 15 through 17, Jesus restores Peter to his rightful place. Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? In verse 15, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter said yes. Then Jesus said, feed my lambs. In verse 16, Jesus asked a second time, Peter, do you love me? Then take care of my sheep. In other words, take care of my church. Then in verse 17, Jesus asked a third time, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Three times the Lord asked, do you love me? Does the Lord need to ask you three times, do you love me, when he woke you up this morning? Does the Lord need to ask you three times, do you love me, when he kept the blood running warm in your veins, when he gave you the activity of your limbs? Does the Lord need to ask you three times, do you love me? When he kept food on your table, a roof over your head. Does the Lord need to ask you three times, do you love me? Jesus said, do you love me? Because I first love you. Do you love me? Because I love you and brought you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Do you love me? Because I love you. Because when you were sinking deep in sin, Far from the peaceful shore, deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. I love you because I heard your despairing cry and I lifted you from the waters. Do you love me because I love you? My father loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you love me? Because I love you. I came down from glory for you. I came down through 42 generations for you. Do you love me? Because I love you. I got dropped off one cold December night in Bethlehem of Judea. Yes, do you love me? Because I love you. I'm the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but I was born in a stable for you. I was laid in a manger for you, wrapped in swaddling clothes for you. 
Jesus loves you. I submit this morning that Jesus loves you because he grew up in Nazareth, walked the streets of Galilee. If you still don't believe me, here's the proof that Jesus loves you. One Friday evening, he went to Calvary just for you. He wore a thorny crown on his head and bore an old rugged cross on his back just for you. They nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. They hung him high and they stretched him wide just for you. I said he died. He died for me and he died for you. I said he died. Didn't he die? They put him down in an old dusty grave all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday night just for you. But here's how I know that he loves me so much because early Sunday morning, I said early Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, he got up, stepped out on resurrection ground, raised his hand, all power, all power, all power, all power is in my hand. He loves us so much that he has mercy power, grace power, redemption power, healing power, forgiveness power, salvation power, all is in his hand. The doors of the church are open. The doors of the church are open. The disciples have been revived. The disciples have been refreshed. And the disciples have been restored. And every now and then we need revival. We need refreshing. And we need restoration. My prayer over the last few years has been Lord, restore the churches that were closed. Father, bring about a restoration to your church universal. Bring us a revival. Give us your refreshing. We need to be refreshed. The doors to my father's house are open. Now is the time and this is the place. Man, woman, boy or girl. Unchurched, unsaved, uncommitted. Won't you come? Won't you come? Give your life to Jesus. Won't you come? The doors to my father's house are open. Man, woman, boy or girl, won't you come? You may come as a candidate for baptism. You may come on Christian experience, reaffirmation of faith. You may come in search of a church home. Won't you come? The doors to my father's house are open. It's all about you now. The choir is singing. Ministers are in the aisles to greet you as you come. The deacons are waiting for you. Won't you come? We offer Christ to you today. To our friends who are watching by way of social media and on the TLE network, we thank God for you. I offer that same invitation to you. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father in heaven, you shall be saved. Make that confession today. And my prayer is once you make that confession, that the Lord put a covering on you and order your steps from this day forward. Make that confession. And when you make that confession, make sure you get into a good Bible reading, Bible teaching church. We would love to have you here at Christ Baptist Church, 4700 East 7th Avenue, Gary, Indiana. But if you can't make it here, make sure you get under the teaching of a good Bible reading church. God bless you.
God keep you in Jesus' name. Amen. The doors to my Father's house are open. It's not too late. It's not too late. God bless you. It's not too late. God bless you. It's not too late. The doors to my father's house are always open. As our ministers and deacons, servant leaders readjust, this is a time we set aside for meditation and reflection, where our music director plays for us music of meditation, where we allow the word of God, the preached word, to fill the sanctuary and penetrate hearts. It's meditation time.
we can do better than that. Let's give God a hand praise for our music director, Chris Sims, and our music ministry. Amen. Amen. We have come to the point where it's prayer time. Jesus said, my house shall be known as a house of prayer. It's prayer time. Sister Stephanie Hewlett is here now to give us our spoken prayer request for the week. Christ Baptist pastor, ministers in the pulpit, we ask all to continue to pray for those on our prayer list as the names scroll across the screen as well as any and all unknown prayer requests. We continue to lift our own sister Irene Lay up. Also, Henry Hurd, the father of our own Keisha Anderson and our own sister Othella Bradley. Specifically, please continue to pray for our bereaved families. It is with heartfelt sorrow and deepest sympathy that we announce the following. Our own Dorothy Geiner, yes. wife of our own Deacon Claiborne Geiner and mother of Willie McDonald. Arrangements are as follows. All services will be Saturday. That's next Saturday, October 15, 2022. And the services will be held at Christ Baptist Church. The visitation is from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. The funeral begins, of course, at 11. Interment is at Evergreen Memorial Cemetery in Hobart, Indiana. There will be a repast at the Chateau Banquet Hall, 530 West 61st Avenue in Maryville. That begins at 2 p.m. Also, Estella Poole, the sister and sister-in-law of our own Deacon Foster and Betty Stevens. She is the aunt of Veronica Kendrick. All services will be Thursday, October 13, 2022 in Dallas, Texas. Services will begin at 10 a.m. at Concord Missionary Baptist Church, 6808 Pastor Bailey Drive in Dallas. And we also need to continue to lift up the sister of our own Janice Williams, that's Muriel Salee. Arrangements are still pending. Pastor, those are the prayer requests for this week. Thank you. Amen. Church, you've heard the spoken prayer request. And we all stand in the need of prayer. I want us to lift up our church family. One of our family members, Sister Dorothy Geiner, I want you to lift up Deacon Claiborne Geiner as he's here today. Let's give God a hand, pray for his strength. We thank God for him and his dedication as he spent the last few days making preparations for the home going of his wonderful wife. I thank God for her because she would spend days and hours talking to my mother-in-law. They were good friends and my mother-in-law has gone home to glory and now Sister Dorothy is with her in glory. Let's keep Brother Claiborne Geiner and his family lifted up in prayer. All who have experienced uh, the death angel visiting them in the transition of loved ones. Let's lift up our young people who are in school. Let's pray for those who are down in Florida and South Carolina who had to experience uh, the hurricane that went through there. Pray for them and their well-being. Pray for the person in front of you, the one behind you, the one to your left and to your right, so that all in the house are prayed for. It's prayer time, and Deacon James Martin is coming now to render the altar prayer. Those that's able to stand, please stand. While we take everything to God in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, I come to bless your name. Oh, Heavenly Father, to give you the praise and the glory. Thank you for this day, dear God. Thank you for life, dear God. Thank you for breath. Thank you for answering prayers, dear God. Thank you for your love, for your joy, your peace, your hope. 
Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I know, dear God, we can't thank you enough. But I pray, dear God, for peace among mankind. This world we are living in is in a crisis, dear God. But we know, dear God, that you will not leave us or forsake us. Pray, dear God, that we seek to be more like you, dear God. Touch us in a mighty way, dear God, where there is hate and prejudice. Lord and Father, give us love, joy, and peace. Where there is war and threat of war, dear God, give us love, joy, and peace. Lord and Father, touch our church and our church families, dear God. Lord and Father, where your word go forth, dear God, touch the preachers and teachers of your word, dear God, that you continue to undergird them to reach out to your children with your word. And we as your children, dear God, will seek your word and abide in your word. And dear God, and share your word. Oh, and Father, discern your word, detain your word, live your word, but most of all, dear God, abide in your word. Well, and Father, we pray to God for our children, those in school and those out of school, dear God. We pray to God that they have a will and desire to do well in school and out of school that you grant them a safe environment to have school in, in their goings and their coming. Touch the teachers and the school administrators, dear God, that they be there for the children with love, compassion, knowledge, and understanding. And, oh, Heavenly Father, we pray for the people, dear God, your children that has been affected and by the hurricanes, by the storms, by the high winds, by the power outages, by the food shortages. Oh, Heavenly Father, touch and heal them by medical shortages. Oh, Heavenly Father, bless them with their needs, dear God, yes. and let us as your children be their father. Oh, Heavenly Father, fill us with the Holy Spirit, Jesus, that we be all about serving you and doing your will. And dear God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. Touch us right here in Gary, Indiana, dear God. Touch our mayor, our city administrators, dear God. Oh, Heavenly Father, touch them that they Govern for the people and not for boss and gain. We pray for nation leaders, dear God, President Biden and, and Vice President Kamala Harris, and, and touch each and every one, dear God, that each and every nation leader will seek you and ask you to direct and guide their path as they govern. And they follow your directions, dear God. Oh, and the Father, they govern for the people and not for boss and gain, war and destruction. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just want to give you the praise and the glory. Thank you for blessing on our pastor that your mercy and grace and healing powers continue to be upon him and his first lady. And to God, touch each and every one of our ministers and ministries of our church. To God, that we be about, all about serving you and doing your will. And to God, we pray for those, to God, that have lost loved ones. Oh, and Father, touch each and every one, dear God. And to God, that we be their father. Encourage them. Touch them, Jesus. Strengthen them their families and their loved ones, those that might be in a traveling mode, dear God, that you keep them safe from harm and danger as they travel. And dear God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. wonderful prayer. Amen. Amen. It's offering time. 
And we thank God that he has blessed us with so much. Now we have the opportunity to give back a portion of that which the Lord has given us. Is offering time. Let us take a moment to prepare our offertory envelopes. And those will be deposited at the end of service upon dismissal in the offertory boxes located at the rear of the sanctuary. We thank God for those who are watching by way of social media and on the TLE network. You will see on your screen a variety of ways that you can give and donate to Christ Baptist Church. We thank God for you. We thank God for you tuning in to the service. We ask that if you're watching on our Facebook page to hit the like button and follow us and then share this service, share this message with someone because somebody needs to hear the word of God. We thank God for you. Reverend Mary Watkins is coming now to render the offertory prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we just come praising you. Father, we magnify you. We glorify your name. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to give back to you from what you have given to us. Father, we ask that you bless every giver, Lord. Bless everyone who wished to give and who is unable to give. But Father, we ask that you bless this offering and use it for the building of your kingdom. And we pray this prayer in your son's name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Were you blessed by the service today? Amen. Aren't you glad you came out to the house of worship? Make sure you go out and share this message with somebody today. And as we prepare to go out from this place, but not out from God's presence, let us stand now for our closing music and benediction. Father, we thank you for all that our eyes have seen, all that our ears have heard, and all that our hearts have felt. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come out to your house of worship. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to render prayers unto thee. We thank you for the word today, but we especially thank you for Jesus. And now, Lord, as we prepare to go out from this place, we pray that you go with us, go ahead of us, and stand by us. Now may the grace of God as Father and as Son, and the sweet communion of God as Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in each of these thy people, now, henceforth, and forevermore, world without end. And all of God's people can say together, Amen. God bless you and God keep you. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.